So let's just pray and trust the Lord will bless us this afternoon. Father, in Jesus' name, we just commit the word to you this afternoon, Lord God. We thank you that it is sharper than any two-edged sword. I pray that we would yield it wisely in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, give us focus. Remove the scars from our eyes. May your word become alive to us in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So, part 16 of David. So, last week, by way of a quick, very quick recap, last week we saw David and Jonathan uh, covenant relationship deepen despite the difficulties that they were facing. They extended the borders of their covenant to include their descendants, their children as well, and they swore friendship with each other because they loved each other more than they loved themselves. Amazing. Yet, unfortunately, Saul uh, believes that Jonathan has betrayed him to side with David. So Saul again attempts to kill Jonathan this time with his spear. Jonathan tells David that he must leave and David again goes on the run. So, Throughout the series, we see all these different sides to David, David's character and David's identity. And the first David we meet, and it's very similar for us, the first David we meet is David the shepherd. David the shepherd. Then David the musician. Then David the giant slayer. David the armour bearer. David the commander of the army. David, the son-in-law. David, the best friend of Jonathan. <coughs> and David, Israel's champion. And you see all these different times in his life where his identity kind of changes <coughs> because of the role that he's fulfilling. And often it's the same for us. You know, our identity or the tags that we feel we feel can change, but God remains the same irrespective to all the different seasons in David's life. And David, this week, is forced to carry a new identity, and it's David the nomad. And a nomad is somebody who travels from place to place without a permanent home. So David the nomad, so 1 Samuel 21 verse 1, says, and David went to Nob, to Ahimelech, the priest. Now, the circumstances are uncertain, but at least David again goes to the right place. Previously, when David was on the run, we saw that he went to Samuel. He went to the right place. And he found wisdom and protection and so on and so forth. This time, he goes to Ahimelech, now, Ahimelech is believed to be the great-grandson of Eli. Now, Eli was the great prophet, but his own sons were rebellious against God. Okay? His sons were wayward, they were evil, they didn't fulfill the will of the Lord. But one of their grandsons has become a priest. And so David has gone to that priest, Ahimelech. Now, when he arrived, Ahimelech, trembled when he met him and asked, why are you alone and why is no one with you? So David has left all what was going on, gone on the run, he's found the priest Ahimelech, but the priest immediately says, why are you alone? And why was the priest scared? The priest was afraid. Now it might be because it was unusual for somebody of David's stature to be travelling alone. It might be that he already disliked Saul and he was worried that Saul would now follow David. Verse 2, David answered Ahimelech the priest, The king has sent me on a mission and said to me, no one is to know anything about the mission I am sending you on. As for my men, I have told them to meet me at a certain place. 
Now, at this point, David is lying. Again. Okay, David is lying. Whilst he may have gathered a small party of men and told them to meet him elsewhere, he was not on any secret mission from the king. Saul wanted to kill him. Okay? But he tells Ahimelech that he's on a mission from the king. Verse 3. Now then, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever you can find. But the priest answered David, I don't have any ordinary bread on hand. However, there is some consecrated, consecrated bread here, provide the men, provided the men and yourselves have kept yourself from women. So there was no common bread available. The only bread that was available was bread that had been consecrated to God. In the tabernacle of the Lord, there was a table, and that table held 12 loaves of bread, which represented each of the tribes of Israel, and it also represented God's covenant relationship with them. And they would eat, the priests would eat that bread in front of the table, which had been prepared for the Lord as an offering. Sometimes it's called consecrated, which means set apart. Sometimes it was called holy. Sometimes it was called sanctified. And sometimes it was called showbread or the bread of faces because the bread was eaten in the presence of the Lord face to face. So it was called the bread of faces or the bread of the presence because it was eaten in the presence of the Lord. So it wasn't your normal harvest loaf of bread or your toasting bread that you get from Sainsbury's. A bit like I was saying about our offering and our giving, it's been set aside, consecrated on purpose for the Lord. You can't just use this for anything else. This has been set aside and that's what makes things holy when they've been set aside unto the Lord. Amen? When the tax man taxes you on your wages and he gets his 25% or whatever it is, that's not holy. But when we give unto the Lord, that changes. That becomes sanctified and holy because it's given unto the Lord for a purpose. So it's consecrated or sanctified. The bread of faces. In that culture, eating together formed a, a bond and friendship. The showbread was often uh, was meant to be fresh. So Ahimelech gave David the old consecrated bread or showbread that had been taken away from the table in order to put hot bread in its place. Amen? So the bread that was being given to David had been sanctified for the things of God but it was now being removed and given to David and fresh bread was put there. And the priests always kept fresh bread before the Lord. Now, you can let this go straight over your head if you like, or you can get it. Fresh bread. There's a freshness. His presence is new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. There's a freshness in our relationship with God. It's not a stale, smelly, hard relationship with God, but it's a fresh, supple, sweet-smelling fragrance before the Lord. That's how we walk before God. And sometimes we can get a bit stale. <coughs> Unforgiveness can come in, resentment. We can get a bit... Apathy can come in. Well, you know, whatever, I just, you know... We can lose our passion and our focus and we're offering God yesterday's seconds sometimes <coughs> rather than that fresh, supple heart, you know. And you get a lot of people when they first get saved and they're on fire for the Lord and they're passionate and they want to talk about God, it's wonderful. And you can get some older Christians say, oh, well, that, that'll, that'll wear off. That'll wear off. That'll go. You'll, you'll just end up treading the milk. That's awful. 
What a discouragement. What a thing to say to people. I want my relationship to be fresh with the Lord. His promises to me are new every morning and great is his faithfulness. How do you receive it from the Lord? Where's your faith? Where's your excitement in God? Even when you're on your knees and yes, the cup's half empty and it's all going peak tong and life's crap. God did not change. What is not worthy anymore because you're in a bad mood? It's not worthy because you didn't have a good night's sleep. It's not worthy because you've got a headache. It's not worthy now because you didn't get the promotion. It's not worthy now because you broke your arm again. It's not worthy now because this has happened or that's happened and suddenly God ain't worthy anymore. Sorry, love. He's worthy, period. It doesn't matter. He's worthy. But we give him sloppy seconds from our heart depending on our circumstances and what's going on. And we treat God like a mere man. But he's worthy. And fresh bread had to be placed on the altar. And I say to us, let, let us be fresh bread. Amen? Amen? David replied, Indeed, women have been kept from us. As usual, whenever I set out, the men's bodies are holy, even on missions that are unholy. How much more so today? So the priest gave him the consecrated bread. Since there was no bread there except the bread of the presence that had been removed from before the Lord and replaced with hot bread or fresh bread on the day that it was taken away. So this holy bread, consecrated bread, is what the priests have put before the Lord, but they've removed it and they've put fresh bread there. And the priests have given David what had been there. Now the law was that no one but the priest can eat that bread. That's the law. That's what the law says. Only the priest can eat the bread. But the priest gave it to David because the law of love supersedes the religious laws. It superseded including the Levitical law of Moses. And sometimes we can get stuck in a rut standing on something and our compassion and common sense goes out the window. Matthew 12, 1 to 4. At that time, Jesus walked through the cornfields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and began to pick the ears of corn and eat them. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. He answered, Haven't you read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? They entered the house of the Lord. He and his companions ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for them to do, but only the priests. If you had known what these words mean, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, then you would not have condemned the innocent. Wow. See, Jesus breaks down the religious rules and ceremony and he looks at the heart. Just like David was a man after God's own heart. And God looks at our heart and he judges the heart. And Jesus reminds the religious leaders of the day what had happened. Jesus challenges us to focus on what's important. Seeking after God, seeking his mercy, not religious laws. God is more interested in a passionate relationship with us than a traditional apathetic heart. God wants our passion, not our religion, not our ceremony, but he wants our heart in what we do. If you're only in church on Sunday, because it's Sunday and that's where we, then you're here for the wrong reason. But it's, if it's because you love God and you love his people and you want to have fellowship, then it's the right heart. 
verse 7. Now, no, uh, now one of Saul's servants were there that day, detained before the Lord. He was Doe the Edomite, Saul's chief shepherd. You're going to find out about him next week. So the scripture highlights that this, the chief shepherd of Saul is at the temple. He's watching what's going on. Verse 8. David asked Ahimelech, Do you have a spear or a sword here? I haven't bought my sword or any weapon because the king's mission was urgent. And David's lying again. We can understand why David would ask for a weapon, but it's sad to see that David continues to lie about being on the king's business because the king's business was actually to kill David. That was the business the king was on. And David continues to lie because David is desperate and he's trying to avoid Saul. And he's lying because he doesn't know who he can trust or what to do. But we're called to live in the truth. Amen? See, David didn't need to lie, he needed to trust God. We don't need to lie, we don't need to bend the truth, we don't need to tweak it, we need to trust God. And that's hard, and that makes us feel vulnerable. Vulnerability. And in, in, in this day and age, we don't like vulnerability. Do you know what? Feeling vulnerable feels very close to feeling anxious. They're very, very, very close. And we live in a society now where you're not allowed to feel anxious. You can't have anxiety about anything. You mustn't feel vulnerable. You must feel secure. The minute you, people begin to talk about anxiety, they want to ship us all off to the doctor. Now, sometimes we might need medical help. Fine. But we will face emotions. We live in a society now where we do not want to feel any form of pain, whether it's physical pain or emotional pain. We don't want to feel it. We want to blot it out straight away. But pain is a part of the natural process in humanity. And in actual fact, there's some pain is good for you. It's actually good for you. It's your body telling you there's something wrong or so on and so forth. Or emotional pain. But we're living in a society now where we're blocking out all of our emotions and just get rid of them. You know? And it's not healthy because do you know what happens? We can't cope. That's what happens. We just can't cope with anything. You know? Absolutely nothing at all. The minute we've got the slightest headache, we've got to take a tablet. What? Just get rid of the pain. The minute there's just get rid of the pain. Just get rid of the pain. It's not always healthy. The Lord disciplines those that he loves. That means sometimes it's going to be painful and the Lord's going to let it happen. Why? Because he disciplines those that he loves. I've never seen a parent discipline a child and say, this is going to be lovely. You're going to like this one. You know? David asked Ahimelech, do you have a spear, a spear or a sword here? I haven't bought my sword or any, I uh, bought my sword or any other weapon because I was on a king's mission was urgent. Now David hadn't got a weapon more likely because we know why the Philistines had prevented the Israelites from making weapons. They were not allowed to have any blacksmiths in the land. And the only two swords that the Israelites had a few chapters ago was Jonathan's sword and Saul's sword. But there is another sword in the land. Verse 9, the priest replied, The sword of Goliath, the Philistine, Stein, whom you killed in the Valley of Air, over here. It is wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If you want it, take it. There is no sword here but that one. And David said, there is none like it, give it to me. Now, I don't know the journey of that sword, 
because David hid the sword in his own tent after killing Goliath. But somehow the sword has ended up with the priest, the Himalek, and it's hidden behind the ephod. The ephod was the apron that the priest wore. And they wore a beautiful ephod. And so obviously the sword was hidden behind that. And David said, there is none like it. Give it to me. Goliath's sword was made, had made its way from the tent of David to behind the ephod. The last time David held this sword, he was full of faith and trust in God. Where are you at today? What are you facing? What's the health of your relationship with God? Think back, remember when you were like, when David had killed Goliath, he was full of vigour, he was full of passion, he trusted God wholeheartedly. He didn't care about his own welfare, he wasn't caring about, all he cared about was the reputation of the God of Israel. That's what he cared about. And he had that sword and he was so full of passion. He was so full of expectation and faith. And suddenly he picks up this sword again and he's on the run, petrified, with no identity, a nomad. Wow. I wonder if his mind went back to when he had defeated Goliath and he'd cut Goliath's head off with that sword. Maybe that sword reminded him of the victory that he'd won. Maybe it reminded him that the Lord could deliver him still, that David didn't need to lie, David needed to trust God. And sometimes we can forget what God has done. We forget. And things you prayed about, the things you asked, that situation you were in, the job you wanted, the dilemma you faced and you needed the answers and God answered and you came through and we can forget easily. And that's why the Israelites had so many festivals and all of the festivals about remembering what God has done. Always just remembering what God has done. Tell it to your children. Tell it to your grandchildren. Tell them what God has done. Tell them what God has done. Absolutely wonderful. And suddenly, this sword has found its way back into the hand of David. See, the weapons God gives you to win some battles, they use the same weapon again sometimes. Now, however, our attitude should be like David. When David received the sword, he said, give it to me, there is none like it. You've all received a sword. There is none like it. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. There is none like it. There is no other sword, no other book like this book. None in the whole of the universe. Hebrews 4 verse 12. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. That's what this does. That's why sometimes we don't like it. We don't, because it's going to be painful. I might cut my hand on it. It might reveal my character. It might challenge me in the way I treat my wife or my children. It might challenge me on the way I am at work. It might challenge, you, challenge me about my finances. It might challenge me in some way, because it judges the very heart. Verse 10. That day David fled from Saul and went to Achish, king of Gath. Now, the last two places David went to was the right choice. Well done, David, you get a gold star. This time, it is the worst possible choice in the world. 
okay, he's gone from being star student to absolute donut, okay? Now, he runs to the king of Gath, or what it looks like to be a donut. He runs to the king of Gath. In what would likely, this would likely a desperate attempt to flee from Saul's grasp, David flees to the Philistine country. The very Philistines that he's been killing. The 200 foreskins. There's a few men walking around with a bit of a limp. You wait till they see David. Huh? But he flees to the Philistine country, knowing Saul's fearful of the Philistines, David knew that Saul would probably not follow him there. They, uh, Saul was petrified of the Philistines. He hid in his tent on more than one occasion and he would not face the Philistines. And he hid and he tried to get away from the Philistines and they put fear into him. So David runs to the king of the Philistines knowing Saul ain't going to follow me because he's chicken. He's scared of the Philistines. David found, which is quite sad, David finds a greater degree of safety in the presence of the Philistine king than he can find in his own land. Isn't that sad? The king apparent, and he's got to be in exile, and being in exile makes him feel safer than what it does being in the land that God had promised him. It didn't make sense for him to carry the sword of Goliath and go to Goliath's hometown. He doesn't just go anywhere, he goes to Goliath's hometown and he happens to be carrying Goliath's sword. And I hope Goliath's mum don't look anything like Goliath because David's going to be in trouble. It didn't make sense for the man who had just been sustained by the holy bread of the temple to then go and take refuge with the pagans. It didn't make sense for the man after God's own heart to change his address to Gath. This is a man after God's own heart. This is the king apparent. What is he doing changing his address to Gath? God is sovereign. See, sometimes we don't know. We only see so much. We're not omnipresent. We're not omnipotent. We're not everywhere all at once. We're not all powerful. We get glimpses. We see bits and pieces. But one day we will know as we are fully known. But right now, Interestingly, the companions that Jesus refers to appear not to have followed David to Gath. This is either because David's companions refused to follow him or uh, into Philistine country, or David chose to dismiss them to go safely another way. David finds himself alone. David is on his own. He is alone in this situation. Verse 11. The servants of Achish said to him, Isn't this David, king of the land? Isn't he the one they sung about in their dances? Saul has slayed his thousands and David is tens of thousands. Now it's interesting that the Philistines would call David the king of the land. Isn't it amazing? They, they referred to David, they said, isn't this the king of the land? The first people to recognise him as king is the enemy. And in spiritual warfare, the enemy knows who you are in Christ Jesus. You don't recognise it, 
But Satan recognises it. Satan knows who you are. He's got your number, got your address. He can't do nothing, but he recognises who you are. If only we would recognise who we are. And yet the Philistines recognised David and said, is this not the king of the land who's here on our doorstep? And sometimes we've just got to know who we are in Christ and things can change rapidly in our heart, our faith and our situation. If we would only know who we are in God and stick to it. Just because you didn't get the job doesn't change your identity of who you are in God. Just because you didn't get the healing, just because you didn't get the partner, just because you didn't get the breakthrough, don't change your identity in Christ Jesus. That's just circumstances. You are still seated with Christ in heavenly places. You are victorious. You are part of, you have been pulled into a triune relationship with God. That's who you are. Yes, you might look like a worm right now. But you can be a worm with attitude. Know who you are in Jesus. I might be a worm, but I know who I am in God. And when you know who you are in God, do you know what? Most of the battles you will stop fighting because you won't need to. When the Gypsy King, the boxer, goes down the pub and has a beer and people are like, oh, I could take him out, I could, I could beat him. Do you think that he merely takes his jacket off and thinks, oh, all right then? He doesn't even bother! What a waste of time! He just walks through this idiot and just walks through it all. He doesn't stop, he doesn't get distracted by midgets. It doesn't mean anything to him. Why? Because he knows he's the Gypsy King. He knows he's the world chat. He knows he's the best. My dad was six foot nine and about 27 stone or whatever, and he was in prison on holiday. And whilst he was there, because he was so big, all the big hard nuts in the prison, what do they want? They want to take him out because they want to prove he's the best. They're the best. They're better. You know? So my dad said they were all idiots. So my dad instead devised this thing, rather than boxing them, anything like that, because my dad was too slow. I mean, if he caught you, he'd hit you into next week. But the trouble was, he was quite slow. He did this thing, you get one free headbutt in my stomach, that's all you get. And they got the chief guy in the prison, the big hard nut, this is in the 60s, go running up, and he's got a reputation to take my dad out, headbutts him in the stomach, puts his own neck out, has to go to the infirmary. And my dad's just walking away, just, I'm not bothered. And sometimes we get so disturbed by things. Oh, what's going on? Oh, the devil's attacking me. Oh, this is happening. Oh, it's all so dark and gloomy. I'm so scared. You know, know who you are in God. And suddenly, the enemy flees. You know? And when you minister deliverance ministry and you see our demons, how petrified they are of the name of Jesus. Jesus, the name above all names, at the name of Jesus, the demons tremble. Really? I think I'll be a bit of a spiritual bully then. Jesus, 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 Jesus. See all the demons, oh God is saying, just quick shut him up. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, blah, 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 blah. I don't know the rest of that one, but never mind. But do you know what I'm saying? No who you are and you won't waste your time fighting half the battles that you burn yourself out over. You don't have to fight them. They recognised he was king of the land, that he killed his thousands. Wow. Verse 12. David took the words to heart because his identity had been revealed. David took the words to heart and was very much afraid of Achish, king of Gath. David knew that he had been discovered. He tried to go there not being recognised, but he turns up and not only is he recognised, they say he's the king of the land, and is this, is this not David who's killed his tens of thousands? And David's saying, I'm in trouble now, help me, Jesus. 
or Messiah to come, because they received their salvation based on the belief that a Messiah would come. And suddenly David's identity has been revealed. David knew that if he was discovered, the king would probably kill him. He could not let the man who had killed Goliath and he's in Goliath's hometown, he's killed Goliath, he's defeated the Philistines time and time again, he's chopped off their winkles, he ain't walking out of the town alive. That's what David's thinking, I'm in big trouble here. Understandably so, David is fearful. And David's deception has led him right into the hands of the enemy. Daniel uh, 2.22 says, The Lord reveals the deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and light dwells within, within him. There is nothing we can hide from God. He knows it ahead of time. Verse 13, So David pretended to be insane in their presence. And while he was in their hands, he acted like a madman, making marks on the doors, uh, doors of the gate, and letting saliva run down his beard. So David's in trouble, his identity's been revealed, he's got to get out of the situation. So I don't know if you've ever seen uh, Blackadder goes forth, and Blackadder wants to get out of the trenches, get two things, stick them up, you know, stick with it, and just say, wibble. That's what David done. David is sitting there going, wibble, uh, wibble, and there's saliva driving, and he's clawing the doors, and he's acting totally insane. That's the best he's got. That's how desperate he is. You know, he can't fight his way out of the situation, so he pretends to be insane. This is David's last ditch attempt to save himself. And in doing so, he degrades himself to such a low level in order to escape the clutches of the Philistines. Bear in mind, this is Israel's champion. The champion of Israel, the one who defeated Goliath. This is the warrior who led Israel to victory after victory after victory against the Philistine. This is the man who has been anointed by Samuel, by through Samuel, by God, to be king. This is who it is. And he's sitting there going, wibble. And ministry of funny walks, he's like, he's, he's gone off on it. He's lost the plot. But this is the great man, the future king of Israel. Who's going to follow him now? The warrior who had led Israel to victory after victory, the one that Samuel had anointed king, is now running around with saliva running down his beard like an uncaged animal. Wow. This is David's rock bottom. This is his lowest ebb. It's easy to forget how much David has lost. His home, his precision, his friends, his wife, And now David has lost his reputation amongst his enemy. He's lost his all self-respect. Everything has gone down the toilet, basically. The whole lot. And David is at rock bottom with no reputation, no friends, no support, no love, no care, no one to lean on and even acting like a madman. Verse 14, uh, Akish said to his servants, look at the man. So the king looks down on David and despises him. This is how low David is now. 
Akish said to his servants, look at the man, he's insane. Why bring him to me? Am I so short of madmen that you bring this fellow here to carry on like this in front of me? Must this man come into my house? And the king is mocking David because David is acting insane. He looks like a mockery. Who is this man? This giant slayer, you're having a laugh. See, when people are down on their lowest ebb, be careful you don't wipe them off. Because this is his lowest ebb. He was a giant slayer. This was his lowest ebb. And people can mock you, or you can mock them when they're on their, when they're on their lowest ebb. But you don't know what God has in store for them. Because God is a God who redeems us. And David's greatest days are yet to come. And they will far outweigh where he's been. And the best is yet to come. But right now, it's his lowest ebb. And sometimes you can judge people when they're at the lowest ebb. And it's easy to wipe people off. And you can say, well, who is this guy now? This guy who's got the reputation, this woman with that reputation, well, where are they now? Where's their ministry? Where's their this now? Where's that now? This is the lowest end. The best is yet to come. God is a redeemer. He is a redeemer. The king looks down on David almost to the point of mocking him. One thing we can say about David is this. He is a fantastic actor. What an actor. If David was alive today, he'd get the Grammy and the Oscar without a doubt. He has convinced everyone he's mad as a fish. And they all believe it. He's that good. They all believe it. What's interesting to note is that David wrote Psalm 56 when the Philistines had seized him at Gath. This means before... David was brought to King Achish. He composed the psalm of deliverance to the Lord. Amen? It made sense that the Lord would guide him, his escape plan, and would humble him. When David tried to protect himself with lies and to find refuge amongst the ungodly and acting insane, David repents and asks God for mercy and trusts in the Lord and it's as if the Lord says to him, keep going, keep acting like a madman, this is going to work. And sometimes God will work in your situation how you never imagined he would. How can God be in this? Impossible. But God's in it. Because God's in it because he said, I'll never leave you nor will I forsake you. He might only be in it to get you out. But he's in it, because you're in it. And if you're in it, he's in it by default. Amen? What grace, what wonderful grace. What joy to know whatever situation you face, God's in it. God doesn't say, I'm not going in there. You can go on your own. Holy Spirit, out of that person. We're wait by the door. When Daniel lived amongst all the pagans, God was with him. When Joseph was in prison, God was in prison. When Paul was in prison, God was in prison. No matter where you are, God is there. Wonderful, absolutely fantastic. When you're on the hospital bed, he's not abandoned you. Don't say a prayer, oh, please, God, be there when I wake up. God's saying, what do you mean, be there? I ain't going nowhere. I'm with you in it. And even in David's moment of low, absolute lowest ebb, biggest mess and half of it is making himself, God is there. From here, David leads. He goes on the run and he goes to Adullam's cave. Having narrowly escaped the king of Gath, Achish, David finds himself now with no security, no food, no home, no one to talk to, no hope to cling to. David was alone, in the dark, in a cave, away from everything. He's become Gollum. 
David's cave dweller. It's become Gollum. It's scratching around, living in a cave in the dark, a damp, stinking cave. This is the king of Israel, the anointed one. It's in a cave, living in a cave. And we can all sit and judge him. But God's got a plan. Don't worry when people judge you on temporary circumstances. Circumstances change. Arsenal could be top of the league next week. <laughs> they change quick circumstances. They really do. You don't know. Don't judge yourself on your circumstances. Because circumstances change. But the word of God remains the same. So feelings change. Three days ago, I had a crap day. I felt crap. It was a crap day. Today, I feel great. Circumstances change. But God doesn't. The word of the Lord remains the same. Irrespective. Even if I've got Rita in the car, giving it this, it doesn't matter. I can survive it. Because I've got God with me. Love you, Rita. Lovely Rita, me to maid. <laughs> so suddenly, he's now alone. And in a mess. And lonely and isolated. David was all alone in the dark, far away from everyone and everything he ever held dear, apart from God. Because God was with him in Adullam's cave. And God's going to turn Adullam's cave round into the greatest training place the world has ever seen. But yet it's a dark, smelly, stinking cave. In closing, Psalm 142, which David wrote while he enters the cave. Just as he gets to Adullam's cave, David writes this. I cry aloud to the Lord. Lesson one. Cry to God. Forget Facebook. Cry to God. Forget gossiping to everybody else. David goes to God first. I lift my voice up to the Lord for mercy. Lesson two, trust God to be merciful. Trust God to be merciful. I pour out before him my complaint. Lesson three, if you're going to whinge, whinge to God. That's what David did. He complained to God. And God received it. He says, all right, get it off your chest. It's better that you moan to me than moan at the dog. Come and tell me. Before him, I will tell of my trouble. Lesson four. David didn't live on a spiritual plateau that he never had any problems. Some Christians think that they no longer have to walk because they're Christians. They can float everywhere. They're never going to have a problem. David faced the fact that he had trouble. When my spirit grows faint within me, lesson four, five, his spirit grew faint and there are times when you, your spirit is faint within you. It's hard work. And that's where Paul says, stir up the gift of faith that is, that is within you. And David at this point is saying, my spirit feels faint. I'm fed up with this. It's you who watch over my ways. Trust the Lord. God's got his eye on you. See, David's reciting this stuff, but he's building himself up because he's got to get back on the horse and be a commander again. See, you can fall over and land in a puddle, but you've got a choice whether you stay there or not. In the path where I walk, people have hidden snares for me. So he knows that people are after him. Look, see, there is no one at my right hand. So he's got no one to lean on. He's used to having his own armour bearers. This was a commander of thousands and tens of thousands. Men left, right and centre that he could call on and lean on and suddenly said, I've got no one at my right hand. 
There's nobody here to help me. No one is concerned for me. He felt abandoned. See, before, Jonathan was his comfort blanket. When he felt low, Jonathan stirred him up. Jonathan gave him confidence. Jonathan supported him. Jonathan was the comfort blanket of man David. But sometimes God will remove the comfort blanket. And sometimes God takes somebody out of your life who's been a comfort blanket because you've lent on them too much and they've replaced the Lord. I have no refuge. No one cares for my life. He's feeling depressed. He's depressed. He's suffering with depression. He's in the pit. It's all gone wrong. He's suffering with depression. He can't get diazepam or centralin or anything. It's a bad day at the office for David. No one cares for my life. He felt unloved. He didn't feel that anybody loved him. Nobody cares about him. I cry out to you, Lord. I say, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Listen to my cry, for I am in desperate need. Is honest with this situation. He doesn't turn around and say, it's all right, be all right, be fine, yeah, be all right. He said, help me, Jesus. I'm in need, I've got trouble. Rescue me from those who pursue me, for they are too strong for me. He faced the facts. He was honest about his situation. He said, Lord, if they get me, they're going to kill me. They're too strong. And sometimes we need, to, we need to just do that with God and say, Lord, life's too much for me. I can't do it. It's too much. I need you to take control. I need you to take the will, Lord. Set me free from my prison. That's how bad it was. He feels he's in a prison. There's no way out of this. A prison keeps you confined. There's no way out. You can't get out. And you are not the master of your own destiny. You can't get out. You are in need of somebody else who's outside the prison to unlock it so that you can get out. Nobody inside the prison can get you out. And we were all in the prison, the slave market of sin. And we needed one man who had never sinned to be able to get us out of the prison of the slave market of sin. And that one man was Christ Jesus. And he set us all free because he was never in the prison. And David is so distraught. He said, set me free from my prison that I may praise your name. Oh, set me free from this so that I may go on holiday and have a lovely time. Set me free from this because I want to do X, Y, and Z. Set me free from this because I want, I want, I want. David says, set me free from this so that I may praise your name. Oh, lovely, 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 lovely. Brilliant. Wonderful. Yes, Lord, get me out of debt because I want to have money and I'm embarrassed of what people think of me and I'm fed up with it. Now, get me out of debt so that I can tell everybody how much debt I was in and how you got me out of it. That's why I want to be out of debt, so I can sing your praises. I don't care if everybody knows I was in debt. I couldn't give a pig's ear about it. It just glorifies God that you got this idiot out of the problem. Woohoo! Wonderful. And that's David's attitude. Set me free from the prison that I may praise your name. Then... The righteous will gather about me because of your goodness to me. Isn't that wonderful? Wow. There's a shed load of stuff just in that, aren't there? Wonderful. Let's pray. <laughs> Hallelujah. Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you so much. We praise you. We worship you. We glorify you. Thank you for this double-edged sword, which is your word. Thank you that by it and through it, you have redeemed us, you save us, you equip us, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you love us as much as you did David. Help us to take the wisdom from that life and apply it 
now, because you are an unchanging God, we praise you, Father. We thank you, Lord. Hallelujah.